moot. Our last conversation is about licensing. And as anybody who is here this morning kind of picked up, it's a little bit complicated, kind of special and unique and technical. But luckily, we have some great people here to help us understand it better and understand if it's possible for you to engage in licensing uh, and what you might get out of it. So um, I'll do, uh, and maybe I should just have everybody take two minutes and just um, say who they are and what they do. And then we'll um, get into the questions. So go ahead, Brooke. I'm Brooke Wentz, and I have a business in San Francisco called The Rights Workshop, and I come out of a music supervision, music director background, heading up music for ESPN um, and all their networks. And um, so in San Francisco, where I built this business, because I'm a native, um, I um, now do music supervision, clearance licensing. We're starting a composer agency, and um, I don't know. That's about it. What was your NPR show? Oh, I did. Well, I did a lot of radio work, which is in New York City for about eight years on WKCR and WNYC, and that's why I got to know a lot of artists, and that's the reason why, actually, a lot of the composers that we signed on the composer roster is the artists that I know from there. Fred Frith being one here from Oakland, and uh, Michael Nyman from the UK, and um, Kaki King, Andy Vedic, I mean, Andy um, Kavik from Vetiver, and uh, a few others. But that's put out, I put out the Raymond Brave record. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, we'll <laughs> So, Brian. Hi, my name is Brian Calhoun. Uh, I work at a company called Sound Exchange. We are a nonprofit performing rights organization that collects and distributes uh, royalties when uh, recording artist music is played on non interactive digital services like uh, internet radio, satellite radio, uh, and cable radio. We pay tens of thousands of artists and we pay many thousands of uh, sound recording copyright owners, which are generally labels. Uh, I run the uh, external affairs department. Kellett. Hi, uh, my name's. Can you hear me? My name's uh, Kellett Chin. I'm the owner of Rolling Jack Records, which is an independent uh, record label. We specialize really in music licensing. Um, I'm also a musician, producer. Um, kind of producing is what I do most and uh, kind of help find musicians, get musicians together. Um, we do we do a lot of um, mostly do film and TV licensing. We do a lot of a lot of music for um, we've done music for HBO, CBS, ABC, um, a lot of a lot of film studios, and uh, do advertising as well. Michael. Yes, uh, my name is Michael Ashburn. I'm an entertainment lawyer here in the East Bay. I've been practicing in the entertainment field for about oh, over 30 years. And uh, my primary focus is in the music industry. Uh, I also represent uh, folks in the film side as well. And I also teach. I teach at San Francisco State. I teach uh, music courses there. Uh, and I did want to say thank you very much to the Future of Music uh, Coalition and also the East Bay Foundation for <coughs> pulling this event together. Uh, it's, it's just so rare that we get so many um, experienced professionals in the music industry in one place in the East Bay where so many uh, you know, artists reside. We don't have to go across the bridge to San Francisco or someplace else. So it's really good. So thanks for doing that. Thank Much you for being here. Michael, I, I was going to actually start with Brian Calhoun, but Michael wrote something on that, that paper up there. So it makes me think, let's set the ground rules here about licensing. I think you've probably done this before. So. Well, I'll, 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 a couple of times. Yeah. Um, well, what I wrote on the board was that uh, in licensing, the parties that control uh, are the copyright owners. And as uh, many of you already know, there are two copyrights in every recorded song. There's the uh, master recording or the sound recording, as some people refer to it. There's a copyright in that. And there's also a copyright in the music publishing. Uh, and sometimes these copyrights are owned by more than one individual, so you could have split rights. There could be two or three publishing companies if you have two or three writers and they control their own publishing. So whenever you're dealing with licensing, you've got to make sure that you start with the copyright owner because unless you have all the copyright owners, you can't license whatever the property is. And I think we had an earlier question this morning where we had a, uh, a, a, an artist that she was the performer, so she actually owned the sound recording, but she was doing cover songs. And uh, her question was, could she license the, the, the recording to, say, film a uh, 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 movie or a television show? And, and what I didn't get a chance to explain, because I didn't have all the information from her, was that 
she could only do that if the publisher of the song that she'd recorded also agreed to the license. Uh, and, and this is why uh, in the rise of the independent musician that they actually have one advantage over the traditional music industry, uh, which is that most indepe many independent artists actually create their own sound recordings and they write their own material. So when it comes to licensing, they have an advantage because it's a one-stop shop. You can get the rights from both to, uh, that you need from one individual. So. Brian. Okay, so what, what Michael was just referring to is something you know about direct, directly negotiated licenses. Um, but what Sound Exchange um, deals with is actually a compulsory license. So, Brian, can you explain what the difference is and what Sound Exchange does? Right. Well, there is a, actually a statutory license in place that allows any service to opt in and play recordings uh, on your internet radio station. So anybody in here, maybe there are some webcasters in here, you actually have the ability to use any uh, anyone's recorded material uh, without having to go and ask, like Michael had uh, uh, mentioned before, without having to ask for specific permission from the individual rights owners. Now, what Sound Exchange does is we collect and distribute on behalf of just part of the copyright on the uh, on the master recording. So. The owner of the sound recording, the sound recording copyright owner, we frequently refer, we just for short, SRCOs, sound recording copyright owners. Now, sound recording copyright owner is generally a record label, but if you are an independent artist and you own your own master, you are a sound recording copyright owner. Um, and we also collect for the performers. The way that the, uh, the license works is that we collect and pay both the owner of the sound recording directly and the performer. So if Michael owns a record label and Brooke sings uh, a recording for him, then when they have earned some royalties for internet radio play or uh, cable radio play or satellite radio play, we pay them each directly. So uh, traditionally under uh, a lot of licenses, and I think I'm sure you'll be getting into this a little bit more, uh, when there's a specific use negotiated for say a film or something, and you're negotiating for the copyright, uh, the, I'm sorry, the sound recording copyright portion of it, the person who owns the master is the one that you deal with, and you would pay them, and then they would in turn look at the terms of the deal with the recording, uh, uh, the recording artist, and then they would in turn pay that recording artist. So you would pay Michael, and Michael would pay Brooke. Now, the way we work is we pay each of them directly. So when the money comes in for a particular recording, we pay each of them directly. And the way that that works is we pay 50% to the owner of the sound recording, 45% to the featured performer, and then 5% goes to a fund which is administered by the unions to pay backup singers and session players. Um, maybe I started getting a little bit too much detail already, but just to, 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 um, to kind of make it a little bit clear, it's best for me to talk about it by way of example. So. If, uh, I'll use another example, let's say if I write a song and Michael sings it, if that, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're certainly in trouble if I've written it, that's for sure. If, if, uh, if the recording that we create is then played on terrestrial radio, so AM or FM radio, I would get paid via ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Those are other performing rights organizations, but they collect on behalf of the writer and the publisher. Michael, being the singer, does not get paid. His record label does not get paid. However, when that same recording is played on internet radio, like Pandora, uh, it's played on XM, Sirius, uh, you know, the satellite radio stations, or cable radio, then I would still get paid through ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, but Michael and his record label would get paid through Sound Exchange. We just had our biggest distribution uh, in the history of the company, and uh, uh, it was for just about $52 million, first quarter of this year. 
Now, because it's a statutory license and anyone can use it, we also collect for every anyone. We, we collect for everyone. We collect for everyone, whether, whether or not you have told us to do so or not, we do it. So one of the challenges that we face is educating people, which is part of the reason I'm here today, is we literally have tens of millions of dollars sitting in the bank for tens of thousands of artists, and we can't pay them. Why? Because they have not filled out a few pages of paperwork, and we can't send them their money. Yes? That's absolutely correct. They are not, there's, there's, no, there's no conflict there. If you, uh, yeah, that's, if you're the recording artist, if you perform, so if you wrote the song that you sing, you collect as a writer from BMI, and you collect as a singer from Sound Exchange. So, uh, that's kind of basic. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that there are a couple of handouts in the back. Brian brought several which explain what he's talking about in more detail, and I brought one as well. So on your way out, you might want to grab one. Yeah, and I just, I'll just real quickly, I just said there's one up there. Uh, this one says get paid, get played, and it's kind of the basics on sound exchange. Uh, one of the questions I frequently get is, why wouldn't an artist register? Well, I actually created a top ten list of why artists don't register, and really there's no good reason to not register. Uh, a lot of times artists just don't know about it, they're confused by the rights, uh, maybe they feel like it's not enough money, or they procrastinate, and those kinds of things, but there's a top ten list up there as well. Um, real quickly, I'll just mention the other two. Well, or should we go? One, no, one thing you should just say is what plays is, because that's part of okay. the, the plays database. Okay, so something we have on our website is called the plays data plays database. If you go on and register for the access to the plays database, it gives you the ability to, to search for everything that the services have reported to us. We pay out based on what is reported to us by the services. So we get huge amounts of data from Pandora and Clear Channel for their webcasts and satellite radio stations. And we take all that information uh, and use it in order to be able to process the payments accurately. Uh, if you're an artist or a sound recording copyright owner, you can go and look in our plays database to find yourself or, uh, as either an artist or a sound recording copyright owner so that you can ultimately register accurately and make sure that you're collecting on all the money that you're supposed to be getting uh, uh, paid on. And one of the things that we always recommend people do is look in there and look for variations because frequently we get uh, information uh, inaccurately to us. So you want to make sure that you're getting all of the money that's due to you. Thank you. Well, do you want to mention your next two handouts, sure, and then we'll move on to sure, something just, else? Sure. Just real quickly, I'll just mention the other. Um, you know, in, in the example that I uh, mentioned, I said that in terrestrial radio, the performer does not get paid, and the owner of the sound recording does not get paid. AM, FM radio stations, basically because of a loophole in the law, do not have to pay for this right. Well, that's something that we are actively trying to change. There is a, uh, some legislation that was introduced called the Performance Right Act, which would change that it would require AM and FM radio stations in the United States to finally start paying performers and owners of sound recordings. Uh, some of you may have heard some commercials that the National Association of Broadcasters have been running all over the country, calling it a tax on free radio, a performance tax. Uh, the truth is that it is a licensing fee to be paid for creators of intellectual property when somebody uses their work and makes, no and makes money off of it. Uh, you know, fundamentally, it is unfair for companies to take somebody's work, use it, make money, and not either ask for permission or provide any compensation. That's our position. And here's a little basic fact sheet on the Performance Right Act, which is also in the back of the room. And one other quick thing I'll mention is the New Artist Checklist, which is something we put together. It's kind of uh, uh, a brief list of some of the things that you need to do as a, um, as a new artist. Um, can you hand the mic to Brooke? <laughs> um, do you... Uh, have a different opinion about the performance right there? Yeah, I certainly do. Okay. But I, I you know, I could go on for uh, Okay. I, well, I just think that what you said about you think that it should be a tax. Well, I think the reality is that the radio stations want to make it something that um, everyday people understand. And the real reason that radio existed was actually to access music and to broadcast music to people so people would buy records and enjoy music. And also, yes, that's what radio stations did. They went in, you know, and, and actually broadcast music so people 
would hear it. And when I worked at a radio station and most of the push for promoting music is to actually get your music heard on the radio and get articles written about it. Now, granted, the radio is, is pro proliferated in many different ways. So I understand where you guys are coming from. But on the other hand, I feel like maybe you guys should have gone after terrestrial radio before web radio, because the web radios are the ones with the less amount of money. And Sound Exchange, unfortunately, went and attacked them first uh, to try and get money instead of going to terrestrial ra radio. So that's, I just have a different opinion. All right. Well, that's I think a lot of the money they collect is also for the bigger artists instead of the young. It, when you guys first came out, you were also pay, you were also charging NPR and other, um, you know, under like college stations and whatnot for uh, giving big taxes on them. And I think, or not taxes, you were asking them to pay. When I think a lot of the artists would actually prefer to see their music on those stations rather than, no, but the, the original fees you were charging them was making them go out of business. So if they were going out of business, I think more people would want to see their music played rather than the little that they're getting compensated. Because I've put famous names of jazz players on in your website in the thing, and they're names that don't come up. So even though you say players, you're talking about Mariah Carey. You're not talking about, you know, the, you're not talking about Ron Carter. You know, so it's a little different. So. I could, as I said, I could go on. So I think, I think what he's doing is a great thing, but I, I wouldn't say, you can say that radio is like, you know, radio exists, you have to look at the history of radio before you say that. <laughs> well, as you can see, there's all sorts of things. I mean, this is, it gets complicated, and there's a lot of different things, and in fact, this is just to sort of back it out a bit and sort of talk about the meta issue is that you realize that the compensation that musicians and songwriters get is actually influenced by policy. So if you, you know, we had a this sort of brief conversation about arts policy under Obama in the last breakout, but it is important to recognize that this is part of the sort of role that we all play as creators in the community is to recognize what policies do to our compensation and actually have understand it enough to either um, advocate for certain positions or, you know, at least understand where you fit into the equation. Because do, things do change and happen in Washington, D.C. that affect musicians and the way their, their abilities to make a living. So um, I want to get back to sort of direct licensing and ask Brooke about how things have changed in the past, say, 10 years with the development of the internet and sort of the, the corollary development of I, what I see as like an explosion of like cable channels and other, and it seems like a loosening up at the ad agency level and maybe the, but it seems like there's more opportunities for music to be placed. So I'm wondering what has happened from your perspective in the past 10 years. Well, recently they did a study and 69% of income generated to um, artists is coming from licensing. So that's a pretty high level. The um, you know, sales of CDs is down. And so they see this as the new form. It's called ancillary income to a record label. And um, uh, it's become a very important one. Uh, digital new media, which is streaming on the web, uh, download, uh, films or, or programs that are aired on, on um, you know, VOD, which is video on demand or streaming. Um, now these rights have to be uh, included in the licensing. It's not just film festival exhibition or theatrical or television. There's about five tiers of television and there's all these different um, digital rights that need to be acquired. Uh, the thing is, is that distributors are asking for these rights from filmmakers, and then, and then the copyright holders are also charging a lot for these rights. And so there's been, in the last 10 years, honestly, 10 years ago, I remember one art filmmaker had this documentary about a, about a, a museum in, in, um, in Massachusetts, and she had one song in there, and I think it was Universal Music Publishing wanted, and the band didn't even exist, I can't remember who it was, but the, they wanted $5,000 for the sync, which is for the publisher, and $5,000 for the master, and that was just for, for, for digital rights. I mean, now you can go in there and you could probably secure that for $1,000 or $2,000, but it, it's just like buying a flat screen TV. It was tremendously expensive for filmmakers, and now it's kind of come down to the reality because of the... Um, proliferation of medias, um, the licensors can't even keep up with the requests, and they also need to charge something so they can turn them around, but of course they can't go that fast. Um, and so, I mean, there is, there is money there for if, if your music is being used on the web, and you do, I mean, we get artists who come in and say, oh, you know, they wanted to use it for this media, but now they want it for that one, and you have to realize that if they want it for another media that was not originally negotiated, then you charge more. 
but most people are savvy enough these days to ask for all media rights, and the fees are entirely based on the media. So uh, out in the hallway, uh, Kellis mentioned that he's done a lot of licensing in the past 10 years, and you said that right now you're using um, an agency to help you sort of manage everything. Um, and I want you to talk about that, but I also kind of want to get to the, the sort of the next obvious question is there are a couple of services that are trying to facilitate, you know, B2B licensing like Rumblefish and Pump Audio. And there's pros and cons to that, and I wanted to get to that next. But please tell us a bit about what your, your experiences have been. Um, uh, as far as, as licensing, um, it's really something that um, a lot of people, a lot of musicians are, have, have become a lot more interested in in the last few years, especially with the decline of, of CD sales. Um, because the, uh, the record sales, uh, it's, it's, going, it's going very badly compared to how it was five, ten years ago. Um, but um, there are areas of, you know, when people say, oh, the music business is doing, doing terrible, well, I mean, the, the, the flip side of that is that um, live music, for example, um, is, is doing it pretty much as well as ever. And another area that's doing really well is licensing, because um, there's, there's more media than ever. And uh, whereas about five years ago, when I would talk, talk to people and I'd say, oh, I do a lot of licensing, people would, would say, what is that? And now, uh, more often I find when I talk to people, I say, oh, do licensing. Pe people's eyes get really big, and they're really interested in it. They want to know more about it. How do I, yeah, like youth film and TV licensing, how do I get into that? And um, there isn't, I, I wouldn't say that there's any, any one answer to that. There are a lot of, there are a lot of different, different uh, routes to, to get into it. Um, me personally, I started out. Uh, I, I started out just as a musician. I had a band uh, called Big Soul. Started out in L.A. and San Francisco, and um, we were just selling our our CDs. Uh, CDs back then, you know, were, were kind of a new thing. So we made our own CD, and and um, we we uh, started selling it at shows for ten dollars each. And um, we had a uh, there was a French tourist that bought one at the Whiskey a Go Go, and brought it back to, to France. And somehow it got into the hands of, uh, well, it was a DJ, a Parisian DJ that started playing it at his club. And then Sony Music, some two guys from Sony Music heard it. And um, they signed us that way. So through that, through that record contract, you know, we had a, we had a hit record in, in France and in Europe. And um, that's how I kind of got into licensing because it's Sony, the, I, we had a really good guy working at Sony Music Publishing who got us a lot of great deals, and it just turned out our music was really appropriate for that. And um, so once the you know after after about ten years, you know, bands kind of dissipated. We stopped doing stuff. I kept on getting calls for saying, you know, I'd like to like to license this, like to like to your music, you know. And they were calling me directly, and I started thinking, hmm, maybe I can. Maybe I could just do this myself, actually. And I also kind of the other thing about licensing is that you know it's 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 not necessarily the kind of thing that where you've got to have a where you've got to have a whole band and you got to be playing shows and doing all that. I can help a lot with licensing, but but I found you know especially because I just, I started a family, I don't really like uh, going and you know going out to. It, to going on tour that much, you know, especially because I've got a family now. I'm more of a homebody. I like to get, like to go to sleep early, get up early. And I really like recording. I like producing. And I really found, you know, okay, this is the thing I like to do. So um, I started, I just decided to start my own company. And one thing a lot of people, they, they ask me, okay, well, what, so, so tell me, so how can I do it? How can I get into licensing? And one of the first things I'd, I asked them about, okay, well, what kind of music are you doing? Because a lot of people who want to get into music, want music licensing, kind of assume, well, okay, I've, well, I've, I've got my music, so all I, you know, what I need to do is just like work on it and work on the angles, you know. But really, it starts with the music. Because if you don't have, you can be a great networker and you can be really great at your connections and you can, you can, you can work that angle of it. But if you don't have the right music, nobody, nobody wants to license your music. So it's really something to really kind of ask yourself about, especially because uh, a lot of people they do more than one thing really well so you may have you know like for example i've got you know my my singer songwriter stuff that i do that's, a, that's acoustic and and kind of uh, personal songs and there may be you know there there may be maybe there there's a need for that but it's but the the, the music supervisors and the agencies they got a lot of that stuff and 
you know, funky instrumentals, you know, kind of mid-tempo. They've got a lot of that stuff. So it's really something to think about. Okay, well, it, it, one thing you, you know, really ask yourself, okay, well, what, what is the kind of thing that I'm hearing on, on commercials, for example, or what am I hearing on TV? And if you can, and, and in your efforts to, to network or, you know, meet music supervisors or people that, that are doing that kind of thing, try to find out. This is, and this is what I do all the time. I try to find out, what do you need right now? How can I help you? Instead of how can you help me with my music, how can I help you? Am I filling your need? And I think that's something that applies to music in general. So, uh, um, Michael or Brooke, I wanted to talk to you a bit about the pros and cons of actually these new music services that remove the middle, remove the negotiation from it. Um, probably one of the benefits of licensing is that you can set a price and talk about it and also control the the ability to say no to something. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons of these new music services that help the licensing? Well, a little. I don't have a lot of direct experience with the new licensing sites, although I have gone on them, and I think that definitely they have a they have simplified the process in an amazing way, uh, and I can see why it'd be really, really attractive to uh, people who need music, advertising, film, directors, music supervisors, because it's in the comfort of your home. You could just look at the music. There's a, com uh, a list of how much it costs for the different uses. And uh, it, it takes so much of the work of licensing out of the process that exists if it's not online. Because if it's not online, then you have to go find the public. If, uh, if it's on, online, generally the publisher and the owner of the sound recording are the per, per, same person. Otherwise, they couldn't do the transaction uh, right at the website. But it, so often in more popular music, this is mostly independent music, but when you get to more popular recorded music, Typically, that's not the case. You have a, a major label that owns the master. You've got a publisher, independent publisher, the publishing rights. You've got to negotiate with both of them. And, you know, it's much more cumbersome to complete the process. So I think that perhaps in the future, we'll see more people sort of gravitating, at least the, the rights owners, because I think the, the convenience uh, and also the people who actually um, you know, who want the music, because it simplifies it so much. So I can see it has a great a role to play in the future, but right now a lot of the music that people are interested in licensing is, is not in one, the, the rights holder aren't the same people, have to go to different people, which makes it not possible to use it. Do you see um, music supervisors and ad agencies um, gravitating towards these sites? Well, anybody who's going to use music, there's three places to get it. Only three places. You either hire a composer who's going to make original music for you, and so you have a brand new sync and a master, right? There is using what's called music production libraries, which is the old way that radio stations and television networks actually used to use music, where the sync and the master was combined, mostly instrumental, some thematic, and it was like a library. You go in, the rate is right there, it's like the rate sheet. What's happened, though, is those, those libraries have become more savvy and are not just doing instrumental music, they're bringing in vocalists. And they're also capitalizing on the um, artists who want to retire and stay at home. And so they're getting name artists, name guitar players, name drummers, name saxophonists to come in and create music for them, which they then license out. And then the third way of, of getting music is by uh, licensing commercial music. And that is the most complicated because you do have to get both permissions and it is the most costly. So what you're seeing, if you're talking about these online services, essentially what they are are just, um, uh, you know, a, a slight uh, gradation away from music production libraries where they want to do, life, you know, want you to get it. But I do remember 10 years ago, there was a company called LicenseMusic.com, and I remember they would kind of pitch it to us as music supervisors, like, hey, you can go on and get this. And there's just, that is not the way music is done because any music, all these prices are entirely subjective. And so you want to know what the documentary is about. You want to know if there's any drugs or violence or blood in them. You want to know what the budget of the film is. You could say Joe Blow is doing a film. Oh, and it's an indie film that he's funding all himself. But maybe it's already been picked up by Disney. <laughs> you have no idea. So you need to know what the parameters are. You know, are you doing it as an ad for, you know, a Coke, or is it an ad for, you know, the new, uh, you know, website developer down the road? You have no idea. 
So that's why it is important to understand, and I have a hard time seeing what those prices are if they're flat fees, unless you go to a music production library in which all those, um, those levels, and they do say, you know, online, how many years, streaming, download, all new media, you know, all rights, and then they should give you actually a menu of what the fees are. And actually, if you can get that, that's awesome. And it does help people move faster, but I do know that from the music supervisor perspective, it's we do not like to go, hey, here's our website with all the music in it. We're going to give you a download code, and you can just go in there and listen, because we do not have time to go in there and to like search and to figure out someone else's new website and how it works and how to put the code in there and to find something. It just, it's just it's unwieldy for us. Okay. Or we'll throw it to an assistant and we'll say, go crazy. But honestly, why would we do that if we've got a ton of records sitting right in front right. of us? Right. So, uh, Callis, do you feel like your experience with Sony in France just sort of built on upon itself because now you're sort of in the Rolodexes of music supervisors and other people who are doing licensing. Does it feel like some you just have to have some way in, and then it starts to build on itself? I do think that that helps, um, but at the same time, you know, when I when I kind of did this, uh, you know, started up my new company, it was kind of a complete reboot for me because I was, you know, you know I, I'm I've got my connections in Europe, but I really wanted to be working here in the U.S. and I wanted to to be doing it myself, and so you know my my French isn't good enough to be, you know, doing negotiations with people in France. And, um, you know, one, one thing that, um, that w what Brooke was talking about, that kind of, that kind of really, um, it reminded me of the point that um, it's really, you know, one advantage of being an independent musician or, or a musician that's starting, starting out or a musician that's, that's unknown is that the, uh, a lot of the, and I, I think I think uh, Brooke, Brooke could probably confirm this, but a lot of a lot of uh, you know the people that are looking for music, they're looking for deals, and so they don't want to pay you know. So if they if they want a song that is uh, let's say that you know you, you want it you want a rock song, so okay, so you think oh yeah this you know what would be really great here is uh, let's see start me up the Rolling Stones, okay so how much is that going to cost? It's going to be a lot. But twelve million dollars. Twelve million dollars, okay. <laughs> but let's so let's say okay. So they so you can't so do so we can't afford. We don't have twelve million dollars. Okay, we can't we can't afford start me up by the Rolling Stones. But what if we had a song that was that was kind of similar, kind of the, kind of the same? And the music supervisors or the agencies they'll tell you that, that you know this is this is a very very common request. I need a song that's just like this, but is not that. So it's just like the Rolling Stones, except we want to pay five thousand or ten thousand instead of twelve million. So I mean, that's that is the, that's a big advantage for musicians that are for independent musicians or musicians that are unknown. So that can give you like a little bit of motivation to say, oh well, maybe I could get into that, because that is kind of a that's 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 one advantage. You know, I mean, if you you know, I'm sure you'd rather have the the disadvantage of being really famous and having a a catalog of of songs that are making millions of dollars all the time, but that's a that's a that's one advantage and a way to kind of get into it. Uh, I, I should point out something else that came up this morning, which any of you could answer, is the difference between the rate of the deal, like the the licensing deal, and then any performance royalties that are generated when it's used. So, can anybody tell you about about different ways that things get used, and then they the way that additional revenue comes back? I do know that. Um, if you're a smart composer and you um, have an in with a network, that you would honestly probably not charge them a composer fee because your um, PRO money or performing rights um, money, and I don't even know, does SoundExchange um, collect on streaming of, for Q sheets of television and film and stuff like that? Like if NBC broadcasts a rerun of an episode on the web, that's webcasting of the performance. So the question would be, to think so it doesn't include okay um but they might stream the music on the side to try and sell it i don't know <laughs> um anyway that that they would say no because the um pro money from the network television is so high but the, the thing is is if it is going to be something that you're doing on a very visible tv show even an hbo show you might bring your fee down a bit because the performing rights money would 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 add up right michael 
Absolutely. In fact, I think BET, um, whenever they wanted music for some of their shows, that was their deal. They would say, well, we're not going to pay you to compose it, but we, it's going to be on the show, so you'll get your money at performance royalties, and people would do it. Um, the other thing I was going to say, I was listening to Kellis, uh, and there's a couple things going on in his conversation about uh, someone wanting a song that sounds like a song that's more expensive to license. There's a couple of ways that people get interested in licensing music. One is they hear the song somewhere, and it's, it's because it's popular, successful, and then they try to find out who the copyright owners are, and they want to license it. So that's one way. And, and the other way is that they have a relationship with a muse musician or someone that's creative, and they feel they can talk to them and get them to create music for them that, that they will license uh, from them. So it's sort of a, a little different, because one's driven by the popularity of the song. Some of my clients, uh, hip-hop artists and so forth, uh, video games, they come to them because they want that sort of sound in their, some of their video games, and so they're familiar with their, their work. So they're not asking them to come and create something like that. They want that particular song, and we do a licensing deal for that video game. But you, to get the other kind of interest, you have to network, and you have to end up meeting people, music supervisors, and so it requires more of a personal relationship, which is great, too. Either way can work. This just depends upon your situation. I was looking for our, oh, here it is, <laughs> the moderator microphone. I, I mean, uh, the question, uh, you have a question. Uh, wait, turn on. Um, I mean, for me, uh, I'm just about to put out a couple CDs right now, and um, well, not, and you know, I keep hearing, well, you have the rights to publishing, you have the right to this, and then I remember, like, well, the only guy who got to control of his master was way back when Ray Charles got it, and all this other stuff. But now it seems like people have this, but I have no idea. I mean, you guys are throwing these terms around like everybody knows what you're talking about. I can't say that I do. So, um, what what does it mean? How do I if I'm going to come out with a, a CD and some of the songs are cover songs and some of them are originals? Um, how do I get the publishing rights and how do I get the master so that I can even know how to get paid on this kind of stuff and what I should get paid? You know, what's what's how if I'm in a situation it seemed like artists way back in the past in the old days would you know nobody would tell them what they could do. They just here's a nice contract and I'm going to make. Five hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to make four dollars. You know, and that was just okay. You that, know, that's the reason why you get lawyers to look over your deal. <laughs> yeah, but so you guys are here. We're we're asking you. You know, how how does this work? Well, if you are the under the Copyright Act, the U.S. Copyright Act, it guarantees to the author of a musical composition uh, the copyright, the right to uh, to exploit that work in, in any form that they choose, or to not. So. If you have written a song yourself that you're going to record, then you automatically own the copyright to that song. Now, if you have other co-writers, then you share the ownership with them, unless you get a contract from them that says they're assigning their rights to you. So that's on the music publishing side. If you're recording, obviously, a cover song, then the copyright to that song is already owned by somebody else. So you can't own it, the best thing that you could do would be get a license to record that song so that you could have it on your album. Uh, in terms of the... And where would they get that license? Well, they could get it from Harry Fox. It would be uh, one place with quite a large catalog. And it's online, too. The, um, they've made it streamlined for independent artists to actually prepay for a limited number of uh, copies, uh, and you can get a license right on your uh, computer. And if you're the artist and you have created your own sound recording, then the only rights that you need to really worry about are other people who are performing on that sound recording, other vocalists, other musicians. You have to make sure you get uh, releases from them, assigning any rights that they might have in the sound recording to you. And the same thing would be true of a producer that works with you. So that you can end up being the owner of the sound recording and therefore be the party in control when it comes to licensing. Yeah, and then you then when you join on Sound Exchange, then you get to collect the royalties when your when your song is played on DMX, on Sirius Radio, on XM Radio, those type of places. And let me tell you, I produced an African record that like sold like nothing a long time ago. But I was in the hair salon and I heard one of my songs there, and I called up DMX and they told me exactly it. it you know, it has streamed 111 times on the you know on all these dates. So they get very accurate. Okay. Here's another question. 
Similarly along those lines, how about if you work in the traditional um, arts um, context of folkloric music and so there are songs that are, we don't know where to trace back to historically that just are part of a, of a folkloric tradition and so as we're looking to make a CD now, we want to be sure that, you know, we don't infringe on somebody's copyright um, rights but we don't really don't know. There are songs that we've asked people uh, from the tradition and they're like we don't really know it's a traditional song and, and is it public domain or can we you know we, we want to make sure that uh, we don't get in trouble when we record the CD and sell it and then someone comes around and says that's my song well there are um, research companies based largely in Washington DC Thompson and Thompson is one that will for a fee research any copyrights that you choose that you're concerned about you're interested in to tell you whether or not they're still in copyright or whether they've fallen into the public domain so public domain means that at one time the song was copyrighted the copyright period has been enlarged over time so initially back in 1906 I guess it was it was 28 years and then they it, enlarged it and gave it another term of 28 years and now it's the author's life plus 70 years so it continues to get larger and depending upon when the song was written and whether a uh, extension was um, obtained for, for the copyright so these are things that the researchers would get into to determine whether or not the copyright period was still in effect or whether it had expired. So. Hi, just in my understanding and uh, my observation, I'll say, I'm, I've noticed like on different television shows, um, listening to uh, elevator music, um, a lot of the music that I'm hearing is acoustic and it's um, kind of folk. And I'm wondering where the place for uh, vocalists uh, are, or is there a way we can find out as a vocalist um, who might be interested in our music, um, vocalists who do contemporary jazz, uh, things like that. Well, if you're hearing um, instrumental music, you probably remember Muzak. Well, they, they still exist, but they now play commercial music. So when you go to Safeway, that's what's being pumped through is Muzak. Um, you could give, I mean, DMX, I mean, I don't know, I'm Direct TV or Comcast user, you know, they got that area there where they list all the, the radio stations, and if they've got some smooth jazz stations, you could probably submit it there, or DMX, I don't know, what do you guys think? <laughs> There's also um, just a question about how your music gets into music, because um, we've had them on panels, and it's really quite interesting. Yeah, they do I'm a sure. lot of very specific programming for, you know, uh, and you all collect from them, right, for music? So how, Brian, do you know how it gets there? Yeah. I, I think you. I don't know how it gets in. I don't know how it gets in. Does right. anybody know? Do you just submit it to Muzak? I'm sure there's, hey, come on, you have to go on the Muzak website. Yeah, sure. Go call them. You're, you're human. You can pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm a musician. How yeah. do I get my stuff in? Yeah. And it, oh, Sonic Bids connects to Muzak. That's good to know. Yeah. I'll do you and then. There you go question is for Michael. So I just want to get this clear. When we have other musicians playing on our sound recording, we have to clear the rights with them. We have to have them sign a release, right? Or else they get a portion of that SR, that sound recording copyright, right? Actually, it could even be uh, a portion of the composition copyright, depending upon uh, if they added some creativity to the song or whether let's say you already did a demo of the song yourself so and maybe you co re registered that for copyright so the issue of the owner of the composition was clear and then you went and hired musicians to come and play that song uh, and yes they would be uh, possibly owners of the uh, sound recording copyright if you did not get rely uh, rights for assigned from them that's right the form for that is very pretty straightforward. It's a side artist a side artist agreement, and usually they're about one page or two pages long. And uh, typically, what's covered is 
whether they're assigning any rights to the sound recording and also whether they're assigning any rights to the musical composition if they have uh, added something to that. Uh, so sometimes the side artists will keep their music publishing rights and sign over the rights to the sound recording if that's the situation. Uh, so uh, you can, you know, there I don't say, I can't say that there's any one particular place, but I would bet that if you just Googled side artist agreement that you would come up with one because it's such a common agreement in the industry uh, that you would find it. Here's another question. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to approach uh, websites like CD Baby when you have to cover copyright before they accept the work? And there are multiple licensing requirements there, depending on it, whether it's streaming or a, a CD sale physically, and where it's actually sold, either in North America or in Europe as well. There are different um, approaches. But what's the best thing for an artist to do um, in terms of getting licensed to get onto those sites? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, if you are the artist, uh, then you would be able to go on to CD Baby and just simply register like anyone else, and they're going to assume and probably is a box that you check to say that you are the copyright owner of the sound recording. And um, So I'm not sure what your question exactly is. Okay, you're not the copyright owner. You're actually you know, using somebody else's cover material. Oh, you're talking about for the musical compositions, gosh. Well, yeah, the then publisher. they would expect you to have a, uh, a mechanical license from the copyright owners of the musical compositions that you are recording because they're, man well, you're manufacturing it, actually. You're, they're not manufacturing it. You're the ones that are sending the CDs to uh, CD Baby, right? So but you're the yeah, manufacturer. Yeah, it's the physical CD, but they also have streaming licensing and other rights licensing as well if it's used you know, another media. I think that that comes out of the old recording contracts, right, Michael? Because now it, because they, some of the old recording contracts didn't have new media involved, so that's probably why they have that extra thing. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, but for for streaming, for streaming, that's going to be covered by ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Sound Exchange. Okay. That for, well, for non-interactive streaming. Um, I know I've been throwing that term around a little bit too, like non-interactive versus interactive. You guys know, the, okay? So interactive means. If you say, I want to listen to Single Ladies by Beyonce right now, you click play, that service uh, offers the ability to do that, that's an interactive service. If it's radio-like, meaning you're just hearing whatever it is that they're programming for you, and you don't have the ability to choose the individual uh, song by the uh, artist that you want to hear at that moment, then that's likely uh, uh, a non-interactive service. The non-interactive services are what sound exchange would collect for. That's why... Um if you're on Pandora, you can only put your thumbs down more three times, right? Six times in a row, and then it's like, yep, per hour. So it's because they're trying; they're qualified as a non-interactive webcast service, even though it feels kind of like you're interacting with it. Um, so Benji had. Oh. Yes, if you're putting a cover song on a CD Baby album of yours, you have to get a license from Harry Fox, and there's a, you pay for a number of uses. So it's like a thousand. I think it was like five hundred dollars for a thousand uses, and that's cover streaming and various. Uh, the ones I used, were, were, I found them straight away. But you can write to Harry Fox, and they will find them for you as well. Is what I understand, but there might be a fee in that. <laughs> yeah, and Sound Exchange pays me all the time, so loving your work. Okay, uh, I have one back there, and then I'll. Uh, yeah, here you go. That, that you're talking about because we had a CD which had um, original music, which was fine. We had cover music, we got the Harry Fox, that was fine. But it was the public domain stuff, which was difficult when we were relating to CD Baby. Not so much about just CD sales, but for the digital part of the service. And we never were able to figure it out. We just stopped. But is there something different you do for public domain? Uh, music in the process of doing the digital agreements licensing. I, I wouldn't think so, yeah, because if it's public domain, you're talking about the musical composition is in public domain, so you don't have to consider their rights at all because they've basically expired. 
so you can use their composition. And uh, I'm assuming you created the sound recording, so you are the owner of the sound recording, so those, you can license it in any way you, you choose. So that should make it easier, not more difficult. So I don't quite understand why that would be the case. I just wanted to address the young lady who was asking about side artist agreement. I don't know if you're a member of the Musicians Union, but that's where you could ask. They would have side artist agreement for you there, and local number six is in San Francisco. That's a great point. All right. We have, let's have, we have time for one more question if anyone has one. No? I do. You do. Okay, go ahead. Actually, I don't have a question. I, I, I didn't want to take over about the Performance Right Act, but I... I I had to address a couple of the things she said. I, I just made a couple quick notes. Um, so first of all, this is not a new fight. This is something that we've been fighting for 80 years. Frank Sinatra was very active in the 60s and 70s trying to get this passed. Um, uh, also, we don't just pay Madonna, and we don't just pay the big artists. The average payment last year to artists was about $5,000. We pay thousands of artists on a quarterly basis. Uh, if you are reported and the services are playing you and you've reached your threshold of $10, we will pay you. Um, also, let me see what else. Uh, the United States is the only uh, first world nation that does not recognize this right and pay artists. Therefore, roughly $100 million is lost by American artists because uh, French radio stations won't pay American artists when their music is played there. Um, and I, I also wanted to say that, you know, you know, looking back in the history, there are actually radio commercials, and I have some, where the broadcasters would say, tune in uh, to the radio, you no longer have to ever buy any music ever again, you can listen to it for free. So that was uh, a big part of their promotional campaign in the uh, 20s. And, and also I just have to bring up one really important thing is the... Uh, uh, the substitution effect that occurs, you know, because you have the ability to listen to the uh, the radio for free, you don't necessarily have to make a purchase. So there are people who listen to the radio constantly with no intention of ever making a purchase. So there's there's definitely that case. And you know, it, I also mentioned one more thing is that the uh, you know I talked about uh, uh, the fact that. There's no compensation and no permission, right? So it's sort of like asking, this is an analogy I use from time to time. It would be like selling uh, Tom Clancy, uh, Universal Pictures selling Tom Clancy, we're going to make a film about your book, based on your book, and we're not going to pay you because you're going to sell more books. So I'll just leave with that. Want to ask a question? Thank you for that. Kathy Hughes, who's a syndicated radio person, I don't know if you're familiar with Kathy Hughes. Yes. She, <laughs> you are. Right. Well, she was just recently uh, shown on MSN really advocating against this as a terrestrial owner, saying that it's, it's going to hurt her and as well as small other small terrestrials and she's really really upset she's and really saying this and i've heard this a couple of times and as artists we stand on an in interesting fence where they say well, they're doing the artist a favor by playing our music how do you address that i mean and she is very adamant about the, that about not paying about not paying and just so that uh, he doesn't have to defend himself entirely uh the the fact of the matter is, is that radio stations historically have made a tremendous amount of money selling advertising time to advertisers based on the power of music to draw in the listeners. And that, that power is basically because of the talent of the artists that have recorded the music and the record companies and the performers. That is why they are able to sell advertising time for the amounts of money that they have. So what Kathy Hughes is basically saying is that she doesn't want to pay any more than she's ever had to pay for the privilege of using music to draw in advertisers. She, that, and of course, you, know, you can't blame people. You know, no one voluntarily wants to pay more money as a cost of doing business, but that's the only argument. Our artists are going to be tremendously helped 
if this passes, because now you'll have art recording artists and labels sharing equally uh, in another income stream, which is really, frankly long overdue, and actually puts money into my clients' pockets, and they're quite happy to get the sound exchange checks quarterly because they say, wow, you know, someone actually is paying us for the performance of our music for the first time yeah, and over, just, the, over these internet. I would just add, too, that uh, in the bill there were really significant accommodations made for small broadcasters so that it wouldn't be something that would be detrimental to them. So uh, basically, if you're, if you're a station that makes $50,000 a year uh, or less, your annual fee would be $100. And that's not $100 per song. It's $100, period. Uh, for and then there are various steps up uh, the more revenue your station earns but up to 1.25 million dollars the radio stations fee would be capped at five thousand dollars a year so annually so you're talking about really small small numbers so the argument that it's going to hurt really small broadcasters is totally bogus no, no, it was, it was, it was five. It, even then, it was five thousand dollars. Let me, let me address the issue of how much the fees were. The internet webcasters had to pay um, for the privilege of broadcasting music to Sound Exchange. First of all, Sound Exchange did not set the rates. The, the, the Copyright Act simply said, "Listen, going forward in the digital realm, we are going to require uh, that." the digital users and broadcasters of uh, music pay for the privilege of broadcasting that music. That's basically all it said. And it said that the rates are going to be set by, I believe, the Copyright Royalty Tribunal. And there was a tremendous um, sort of uh, lengthy and sort of contentious uh, rate-setting uh, process where both par all parties came and expressed themselves before the tribunal and basically, they made a decision about what the rates were going to be. That decision was hugely unpopular because it put a real burden on some of the, the sort of the uh, small uh, webcasters. And the, as a matter of fact, that got reversed eventually, and they had a uh, it was negotiated to a voluntary yes. license, right? Yeah, exactly. So what there what happened was there was uh, something called the Webcaster Settlement Act, which gave Sound Exchange the the authority to work with the webcasting community to negotiate alternate rates. And so there are rates now with all types of different service providers, different categories. Uh, you know, you talk about very small webcasters; their fees are five hundred dollars a year. So I mean, they can be they can be very small. Uh, there's a rate that, you know, certainly Pandora, who is, uh, I know, an Oakland company and um, a, a hugely successful and popular uh, uh, webcaster, I mean, they have rates that they're comfortable with and they're happy with. In fact, at uh, the uh, conference tomorrow, Tim Westergren and I are going to be on a panel. Uh, but there are now rates that are in place that have been voluntarily negotiated between Sound Exchange and members of the webcasting community. So there are a whole bunch of different rates. And, uh, uh, you know, something that you, I know the book had mentioned that it can be confusing, and it certainly can. So it's also, it's a good idea to get, to get an attorney who is familiar with uh, the process associated with opting in for the different types of uh, classes and rates and reporting requirements. Uh, in fact, on that note, we are having a webinar for service providers on June 30th, and you can register. Uh, we, the information is up on our website, soundexchange.com. So we're just going to close up with um, David D. Huff uh, making a comment, and then it's time for drink tickets. So hold on, here we go. Um, three things. One, um, I'm glad you clarified a little bit of the, the Settlement Act, but I, I get annoyed sometimes when we talk about the uh, eight, uh, 848 because they always toss up the quote-unquote agreement that came about with webcasters when, in fact, it was more of a loss. You know, the webcasters lost, and it was a huge, huge fight. Um, which, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we, we lost, and this is what we have to do. It wasn't like this real jovial kumbaya type of scenario um, that sometimes gets painted. The second thing is, you know, I'm going to tell you from Pacifica, I don't know how this whole thing works out, but for us, we got this whole crazy scenario with anticipation of this in, in, in web rights where we can't play, you know, our specialty shows no more. We have to sign this deal. Um, with, I guess, CBC, or otherwise we're going to pay these extra fees. Lawyers sat down, and the end result is all our specialty shows is we want to do a George Clinton hour, we can't do it. A Grateful Dead hour, we can't do it. And it all points back to these various bodies. I'm not going to say it's sound exchange, but it's 
it's in that realm but the bottom line this is what happened with us as a station and people ain't happy about that they're also not in the room to express that and the third thing is payola i don't understand how this payment works are we saying that payola has just disappeared and no label is doing business and getting you know compensated free concerts or paying money um in lieu of what they would have to now pay the artists if if for, in other words if if somebody walked up there and paid x amount of money say 150,000 to some big radio conglomerate they're getting 150,000 back or that radio station's paying that back and I'll use Kathy Hughes for an example she was p charging artists like $1,000 to listen to the records not even just play them so how does this whole thing work is the artist getting $1,000 back all of a sudden or, or is it a discount on whatever money you had to pay these radio stations to be listened to? How does this work? Because I don't think payola has disappeared. None of the people that I know are saying, any, you know, they're like, I'm not paying is what I'm hearing commercial people say. So if they're not paying, what's the side deal that's being caught up? And will independent artists be the casualty of that? Because some big label can walk up in there and cut these side deals, whatever they may be, and there's going to be little John and little Jenny with their stuff that isn't being played on a station like KML now, won't be played on it tomorrow, and I don't see where these checks is going to come even if they are being paid. Any comments? <laughs> There's one. That is okay. One comment is that in, in cyberspace, it's not illegal to pay for play. So it's not a violation of the Parola Act to actually, in fact, many uh, webcasting stations advertise that you can pay and have your material uh, included in their playlist. So it's a different, where that's not true when you're dealing with over-the-air uh, radio. It's still against the law. Uh, it's only against the law to do it if you don't tell the public that you've been paid to play it. You can do it over the air as well if you say this is a, you know, this is being paid by the record label. But if you don't, if you pretend like you're just adding a song into your playlist uh, over the air, it, it's, that would be against law of sale. So that's the one. All right. I think we're done. I, we've done good work today, haven't we? So, um,